following activity is brought to you by the American Urological Association. The American Urological Association is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. To learn how to claim CME credit or to view faculty disclosures, please visit the AUA University at auanet.org backslash university. Okay. Um... Thanks everybody for, for coming. Uh, late uh, <clears throat> Monday time slot here. Um, but uh, thanks for coming and uh, this is being live streamed to uh, uh, what I've heard is millions of people across the world right now. So, um, uh, you know, don't worry that, that if, if you're not here in person, you'll definitely um, still get the full effect of the course. There's a couple of housekeeping things we've got to talk about. Before we start, um, this course utilizes the audience <clears throat> response questions to participate. Um, uh, we'll give you some instructions on how to use it um, as we go. The AUA 2002 annual meeting app is available and free to download. Um, use your email to register uh, and your password is your AUA ID. <clears throat> um, so I'm Tom J. Ram. Uh, I'm joined here by two friends and colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Gordon Brown and Dr. Neil Shore. Um, uh, and the, the topic today is immunotherapy and, and urologic practice and, and how to operationalize it and kind of how to uh, bring it more uh, internally and, and towards urologist practices. So um, we're gonna spend some time talking about kind of three, uh, three topics on what we think is kind of an important part of the strategy here. Um, so uh, the policy for the AUA is that we all disclose prior to our presentation all financial <clears throat> relationships and that those will be disclosed. Um, please remember to silence your cell phone. Um, no photos, uh, video, or audio recordings are permitted. Uh, and, and the evaluation results at the end of the course are important because the courses are graded and selected based on those. So please keep that in mind. Um, and if you complete a course evaluation, you will be uh, entered into a drawing for a complimentary registration for next year's course. So, um, and at the end of the course, there is a post test, which we take very seriously. Um, and as part of our uh, uh, educational outcomes research, you'll receive uh, an evaluation survey and a post test. And completing this is required to claim credit for the course. Uh, everyone who completes this will be entered for a Visa gift card drawing. <clears throat> Okay, terrific. So, um, again, operationalizing immunotherapy in urologic practice. Um, the three of us uh, <coughs> all have, <coughs> uh, I would say, uh, significant experience in this topic, uh, and I think you're going to have hear some interesting anecdotes, stories about how we have done this, uh, what we perceive to be the benefits, what we can do better, um, and and really how to bring this uh, closer to home and, and more uh, centrally tuned for our patients. Um, <clears throat> so here are our faculty disclosures. These are on the AUA uh, website as well. So again, three uh, kind of big pieces uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, Dr. Shore is going to start by talking about the relevance and the utilization of, of checkpoint inhibitors in urologic oncology and kind of where we are with, with the science and, and the data today. Uh, Dr. Brown is going to talk about kind of the practice implications of implementing a checkpoint inhibitor program, um, the structure, kind of what it takes, what, what in, um, you know, <clears throat> how, how to implement it. And then the last part, uh, I'm going to uh, conclude by talking about kind of the, the efficacy and the safety part of it, how to manage adverse events from checkpoint inhibitors as part of kind of a structured program. So we do want this to be interactive. Obviously, there's microphones down the middle uh, of the aisle. Um, any questions? And you know, let's keep this fun and, and loose, and um, just kind of hang out. So I'm gonna uh, give this to, to Dr. Shore. He's gonna. I think we can probably all do this from our seats. If you can't hear us, let us know. Well, thanks very much, um, Tom, and and thank you so much for your. Uh, initiative to do this course and, and, and asking myself and, and Gordon here to be part of it with you. Um, as you know, as you've pointed out, th there's my, my task will be talking about the relevance and utilization. 
And I think we're, as all of us who are Euro-oncologists and in uh, large practices, and when I say a large practice, I think that includes academic as well as community practices. And in 2016, when we saw the first approval of a checkpoint inhibitor, PD blocker, bringing in this notion of a different mechanism of action, novel mechanism of action, novel therapeutics for patients in bladder cancer, we've seen incredible advances in the last six years. I mean, we talk about living in dog years, where one year is, is seven years. The, the, the last six years have been unbelievable. You, you look at a drug such as pembrolizumab, which I think has over 30 approved indications for different tumor streams in the last six years, just for that particular checkpoint inhibitor. And I'm sure what, if you look at the checkpoint inhibitors, avelumab, devalumab, atezolizumab, and nivolumab, now you have five checkpoint inhibitors that are approved in the area of, of bladder cancer. We also have many of these involved in kidney cancer, many of these, in, uh, or, or more opportunity even in prostate cancer. We'll talk about that. But what's really exciting to me in the last six years is recognizing that Euro Oncology is part of the multidisciplinary team here. I think it's great that the AUA has courses like this. This gives us all an ability to say, how do we broaden the field? How do we broaden exposure for most importantly, so patients can get access? I think Gordon and, and Tom and myself were fully aware that you know, 80 to 85% of cancer care happens in the community. We have tremendous cancer care that happens at our tertiary and academic centers, but that's only 15 to 20% of it. So how do we make sure that we get patients who have bladder cancer get access to all of the level one evidence, grade A evidence, and get the right care that they need with the, with the right physician and at the right time? And that's, a, that's our goal. There's, there's no longer internecine concerns of subspecialty or specialty versus another. That's a really tired conversation. The, the real thing is, Patients require the ability to have access to care, and they require access to care with someone, ideally, we're in this forum, we're talking about your oncologist who can deliver that care, and not just in the United States, but globally. So I really, again, thank Tom J. Ram for putting this all together. Uh, we're really glad that we have you know, so many people watching virtually, and, and for the folks here in the audience. Okay, so, I've already gotten, gave you a little bit of a preamble about, you know, why we think um, immune checkpoint inhibition or, Euro, you know, uro-oncologic opportunities, PD blockers, a lot of different ways of spinning this, saying it. Verbiage counts, but at the end of the day, who are the, you know, the, in, uh, the initiators of immuno-oncology in bladder cancer, and the answer is urologists, because we've been giving BCG since the 1980s, thanks to Pablo Morales. And so we understand that immuno-oncologic benefit exists. In prostate cancer, urologists have, have been, at least in the community, really at the forefront of giving Cipula cell T, which is an immunotherapeutic in prostate cancer. Uh, and so now we have this incredibly rich opportunity, rich when I say that in education and in patient benefit, uh, for immunotherapy in GU oncology. It's, it's not just in bladder anymore, but there's opportunities in kidney and prostate, largely though right now in, in bladder, but it's certainly in kidney as well. And our, our presentation today is, is to just kind of talk about the broad brush strokes and why this is so important without getting you know, very deep into a data dive on all these amazing trials that have been out there, because there really are some. But we're going to talk about the background today. That's my charge. And then Gordon's going to talk about the implementation. And then Tom's going to review, which we think is one of the biggest barriers to entry, is just how can I deal with this from a safety and an adverse event and toxicity standpoint? So we want our, our listeners to say, yeah, I, I can do this. A, for the right reasons, because there's clinical utility and relevance, 
B, I know how to implement this. It's not that cumbersome. We have some really great videos we're gonna show you of, of our uh, nursing key members who, and, and how we do it, you know, unscripted, live. Well, that's not live, it was live when we recorded it. But, uh, and then ultimately, how do, how do we think about safety and adverse event management? And Tom's gonna review that. Uh, we have had, over the course of time, a, a limitation on existing therapies. Um, let's talk about first, you know, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, I remember back in 2016 when I, I, I had the really good fortune to do a program with Judd Mal and um, here at the AUA, I forget where it was in 2016, but it was the first CME symposium that had been done on advanced bladder cancer in literally like 25 years, that was six years ago. And it was me and Dan Petrolak and Judd Mal, and I think Rob Dreiser was on the panel. And the place was packed. And people were like, wow, this is it's cool. It was a CME dinner symposium. And we were talking about the new potential, uh, F the new FDA approved indications for atezolizumab at the time in uh, frontline metastatic bladder cancer. And but prior to that, let's look at BCG and its role in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and the evolution with intravesical chemotherapies. Uh, the recent approval of pembrolizumab in uh, BCG unresponsive CIS, a really big deal in 2020 that came out. And there is a clinical trial pipeline that is so amazingly robust right now, maybe we'll talk about that later, in both intravenous and subcutaneous administration of checkpoint inhibitors in both BCG unresponsive disease for high risk NMIBC as well as for BCG naive. This is all part of the uro oncologist domain. I mean, bladder cancer, whether it's TAG1 or G3, but certainly TAG3 and CIS and T1, particularly the high-risk NMIBC group, is, is, is a super important in trying to optimize care. And if you put that in conjunction with the BCG shortage, which different parts of the country, different uh, colleagues around the world have shortage, not everybody does, some do, and I think to the, to the, to the credit of the manufacturers of BCG, they're, they're doing their best to up the production. We have tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been uh, utilized, particularly in renal cell cancers for the longest time. There's probably now seven to eight different oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are available with or without the addition of a checkpoint inhibitor. Very, very important for our colleagues to understand how these oral therapies work, but that's a different conversation. They're technically not immunotherapies. We have antibody drug conjugates that are, uh, have been approved, other oral agents looking at FGFR inhibition, all in bladder cancer, as well as applications in kidney cancer. So it, it's not about, to me, if you're gonna be doing this, it's when are you gonna start. Um, Tom and Gordon and I have been involved in the um, education of advanced prostate cancer clinics, or what some call APCs. You could pick your acronym of choice. But then there's also the ABC, the Advanced Bladder Cancer Clinic, and the Advanced Kidney Cancer Clinic, or what some would just say, you should have an ACC, an advanced cancer clinic, with all due respect to the Atlantic Coast Conference in the <laughs> Southeast. That's a US thing. <laughs> um, so there is just a flurry of on-label and off-label. We're gonna stick to on-label stuff. This is a CME pr uh, uh, presentation, but the awareness, boy, in six years, there's been quite a bit and more coming. There were new data presented here at AUA in 2022. There's going to be exciting new data presented at ASCO 2022, and there will be more data next year at AUA 2023 in Chicago. Um, data that's going to come forward at EAU and at ESMO. 
This is a remarkably exciting, uh, vigorous, enthusiastic time to be a euro-oncologist. I mean, it is a great time. There's so much involvement, so much more we can do for patients, and so much more we can do in the clinical trial landscape. So I, I think what I'm trying to get across here is, is how passionate Tom and Gordon and I are about uh, helping our colleagues organize and delivering uh, advanced therapeutics, not only in prostate cancer, but in, now in bladder cancer and kidney cancer. And this is the, sort of the overarching theme for today's program. Um, Gordon's going to spend a bunch of time really kind of, and we'll, we're all going to be talking back and forth on, you know, the workflow and efficiency. So many times, uh, you know, our industry colleagues, even our association colleagues, whether it's AUA or, or, or LUGPA or EAU or SUO, will say, well, well, what's the workflow? How do you do, what, what, what's, what, what does good look like? And the answer is, it looks like a lot of different things. There's a lot of heterogeneity and local ways of doing it and doing it well. And it's not a one size fits all. It's what's, what works best in, in Nashville, Tennessee versus you know, New Jersey versus you know, South Carolina or in, in even for my role working with um, colleagues in Genesis Care and, and those are in a bunch of different states. Um, I think it's really important to we talk about the patient experience. That is the North Star, right? Is how do patients get optimal care to all of the approved therapies? Cure is ideal, but if they're not going to be cured, and let's face it, patients with advanced bladder cancer, first line or second line, post RC or metastatic at presentation clock is ticking fast for them. This is a much more aggressive disease as a general rule than for our patients with advanced prostate cancer. So familiarity and experience and getting the experience and getting started up is absolutely an, a, a quintessential goal for not only U.S. uro-oncology but uro-oncology globally. Um, so that's why we're here to talk about how do we enhance um, access. How do we uh, enhance this awareness? We'll talk about clinical trials if we have some time. Multimodal options. Is it just an IO therapy, a checkpoint inhibitor? Can you combine it with other things? Will it ever be neoadjuvant? Is it only adjuvant from our patients with muscle invasive disease and or metastatic? A lot of different options out there now. Combinations, neoadjuvant, adjuvant, Really exciting time. Uh, the adverse event management, Tom's going to talk about this. It's one of these canards that I've heard over the years. Oh my gosh, you know, if, if, if Tom's not available or Gordon or Neil aren't available, what's that on-call physician going to do? I, I, I find that so um, startling that people still ask that. You know, non oncologic urologists are pretty smart folks and they can handle a call from somebody saying, hey, I have a fever, I have a rash, um, I'm dizzy. You know, things can be handled on, for the on-call physician. That should not be a litmus test for being able to do these therapies. Most importantly, it's education, typically in my experience, I'm curious what Tom and Gordon think, is your your allied health team, whether it's your nurse practitioner, physician assistant, MA, RN, really carefully educating patients about what to expect. Not dissimilar for how we treat all advanced GU oncologic therapies, but very true about IO therapy, and, and Tom's gonna go over that. Uh, centralizing care, efficiently organizing this, having nurse navigators, we hear a lot about this, it's very important. Um, we have a physician shortage of people. We have a graying of the, of, of the world, which means an expanding geriatric population. And bladder cancer, kidney cancer, prostate cancer, this is a disease of the geriatric population, by and large, not exclusively. And with uh, this expansion, more and more patients with advanced geo-oncologic concerns will need a euro oncologist to be central to that activity and that care and that diagnosis, that evaluation and that management. 
We're working really hard to bridge these gaps in the community. That's courses like this and the importance of how do we um, create pathways. They can't be too simplistic, but a pathway that nonetheless gives you a roadmap to say, okay, how am I going to use my IO therapy in bladder, kidney, prostate cancer, whether it's on approved indication from the product information to clinical trials. And all three of us do a lot of clinical trials, <laughs> and we're always encouraging our colleagues to get to stand up and, and get their clinical research bona fides, because that's really the ultimate goal of being a physician scientist. So we have immuno-oncologic approvals in bladder cancer. Um, Pembrolizumab, as I mentioned earlier, this is a very important uh, approval that occurred in, 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 in uh, actually I believe it was in February of, of 2021, if I'm not mistaken. But thanks to you know pioneering work by Arjun Balar and others, and many of us who participated, I, I know I was part of this trial, the Kino 57, I know Tom and Gordon, I believe you guys were very involved. And so this is really the first and only to date indication for uh, a checkpoint inhibitor in patients who have BCG unresponsive CIS. Heretofore, we give rounds of BCG, we give rounds of intravesical chemotherapies, whether it's mitomycin historically or now most recently gemcitabine and or with docetaxel. But at the end of the day, there's a proportion of the BCG unresponsive CIS population which will ultimately go to cystectomy. I think it's fair to say that most patients, the overwhelming majority of patients would like to try a therapy. Did I lose the, uh, you still hear me? Now? That would like to try anything to maintain their bladder. Nivolumab as well as, as others, and this is a, a, a very, very important study published in, in New England Journal, Dean Bajoran, the Checkmate 274. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the, the, the details and show you the study schema for this, but for adjuvant treatment of patients post-radical <laughs> cystectomy with high risk of recurrence, and, and you see the breakdown here of chemo-naive, prior chemo, and these are typically platinum-based therapies, and regardless of their immunohistochemistry PD status, um, there was a two-time median disease-free survival benefit in patients receiving uh, nivolumab. Uh, this is really important because we now have entered into an, uh, the arena for maintenance therapy, frontline therapy, post-platinum progressive therapy, for patients to receive immuno-oncologic therapy. So maybe a lot of the urologists who are listening are saying, well, wait a minute, I just kind of, I walk away after a patient uh, is going to, I walk away meaning I'm not going to be part of the treatment management if a patient's going to get platinum-based therapy, which I fully understand. But, but two, two caveats to that. One, not everybody is platinum eligible. And it's very important for our colleagues out there to understand what are the criteria for platinum ineligibility, They're oftentimes called the Golsky criteria. And to be ineligible for cisplatinum, and all of the data really speaks to receiving cisplatinum, whether it's in MVAC or dose-dense MVAC, and, and not really getting carboplatin. And there's a difference in those, in those molecules and their efficacy. But to be ineligible for platinum, there are criteria that have to do with having a baseline adequate creatinine clearance, having a, a avoidance or lack of hearing toxicity or neurologic toxicities, and other cardiovascular issues as well. So not everybody's gonna get platinum-based therapy. That said, it's level one evidence that in the neoadjuvant setting or in the patients who didn't receive it in the neoadjuvant setting who had RC or who present with first line metastatic disease and they're platinum eligible, they should receive that. If they don't, then there's a, a multitude of checkpoint inhibitors, PD blockers, and we've mentioned them already, where patients can benefit 
with bladder cancer. Um, now, as it comes to, that's just bladder. Let's talk about renal a little bit. Great work by Tony Chiwari. Tony Chiwari has really been one of uh, the absolute leads in um, renal cancer systemic therapies. Brian Rinney in the United States, Tom Powell's in the UK. Great friends and colleagues to the urologic community. But pembrolizumab in this particular trial, also published in NEGM, the Keno564, and this supports the, the results to use Pembro as adjuvant therapy for patients who've undergone a nephrectomy uh, who have high risk of recurrence. Important to understand the stratification for what's considered low versus intermediate and high risk. There are different algorithms to look at. They're not complicated. You just plug them in. But if you have high risk issues, then you're a really strong candidate based upon the study, as you can see in the Kaplan-Meier a separation of the curves for disease-free survival benefit at two years between those who receive pembrolizumab versus those who receive placebo. So another indication of another different uh, IO. And um, there's other great studies in, in a multitude of the five different checkpoint inhibitors. We're not trying to pick one versus another. We're, we, we, we feel that you should be familiar with these, and that's a a much more in-depth presentation. We really want uro-oncologists to recognize that you have opportunity to use it in a multitude of different settings in GU-oncology. So I talked about bladder, I talked about kidney. What about prostate? Well, genomic profiling is so important now for our colleagues around the world in so many tumor streams. It's focused on prostate, where I think most of us are hearing the importance of testing for germline or hereditary risk cancer, as well as somatic for patients who have, or another way of thinking about somatic is the tumor tissue, making sure there's adequate tumor DNA. And that can be obtained either through tissue specimens, prostate biopsy, archival, or fresh, or it can be obtained through the prostatectomy specimen, or it can be obtained through metastasis-directed biopsies, or it can be obtained, if you can't get the tissue, blood-based, or what we call liquid, looking at circulating tumor DNA. If you happen to have um, what's described as um, microsatellite instability, uh, which you can find on a variety of different testing platforms, then you have a tumor agnostic, ind tumor agnostic indication for pembrolizumab. Uh, there's also, and it can be a little bit controversial, looking at the notion around tumor mutational burden, particularly if you have more than 10 mutations per megabase, words that you may not be completely familiar with, but it opens up an opportunity <laughs> to have an, a, the use of a, of a checkpoint inhibitor such as uh, of pembrolizumab. And even though the last bullet talks about only four to five percent of patients, if you do enough testing, you'll find these patients. And it's a really um, kind of a nice eureka moment where you say, hey, guess what? I have something for you um, that it adds to the armamentarium of the toolbox. We see things like this in other gene alterations in metastatic colorectal cancer and other tumor streams. And so the whole field of advanced oncologic potential is not just in geo-oncology, but it's throughout numerous tumor streams, breast, ovarian, pancreatic, lung, colorectal, and more. So what are the future applications of immuno-oncology and urology? Well, uh, we always like to think in sort of your First shot may be your best shot. Patients have a better performance status. They tend to be younger. Maybe they have less tumor burden. Typically they do. They be, may have a, 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 a more enthusiastic approach towards multimodality therapy. And again, their performance status is usually better and they're more motivated. So we're looking at, and assuredly, we will have successes in the neoadjuvant and the perioperative application in renal cell cancer and in urothelial cancer as well, especially for the patients who are platinum ineligible and also for patients uh, that's cisplatinum as opposed to carcinoma in situ. 
And there's an exciting opportunity to even combine checkpoint inhibitors with BCG and other intravesical uh, opportunities. So I think we'll go, this is um, Joni Fall, who has been my director of um, systemic therapies in my clinic, not in my research component. And she is just, um, Tom said, let's, let's just do a video completely off the cuff. And so here she is. I don't know, do I activate this or does do our AB expert activate this? Looks like you do. Hi, everyone. I'm here with my uh, nursing director of all of my uh, systemic therapies, Joni Fall, and this is Neil Shore on the camera. Joni's been with me for six years, and, and thanks to her, we've been able to administer checkpoint inhibitors to our patients with bladder cancer and, and, and for approved labeled indications. Most recently, for BCG unresponsive CIS, we also administer checkpoint inhibitors for patients um, in first line and second line uh, metastatic uh, urothelial cancers. Uh, so Joni, you know, maybe you can share with our colleagues your experience. Hello, um, glad to be here with you today. And what I have here is our infusion room. So whenever Dr. Shore um, identifies a patient who qualifies for our immunotherapies, we start with education and then with the patient, I bring them in, have them seat in our uh, recliner chair, I talk to them about the medication they're receiving, any type of immunotherapy responses that they might have adverse reactions to, and to kind of let them talk to me about what they're feeling and what they think about their uh, treatment. So after we get through with the information, I have them sign a consent, and then we establish a date and time for them to start. We also make sure they have the pre labs done. We're looking at their um, anything that could correspond with their amylase being elevated or if their thyroid is not working correctly. Or Dr. Shore's iPhone is not working correctly. <laughs> Do you lose Wi-Fi there? Oh, is that it? Yeah. Apologies for the camera work. But what, I think the thing that you want to see in that is, you know, I, you know, one of the things, and, and maybe we'll t have an opportunity to talk a little bit here. You know, when I first started doing infusions and, in, in, you know, zoledronic acid and sip tea and other things, people would say to me, well, how, how, what's your infusion suite look like? Do you have a suite? I'm like, I don't have a suite. I have a Barker lounge. It's a Barker lounge chair. I know I'm not promoting Barker lounge chair. It could be any lounge chair. You know, you can get it at, you know, Costco. Uh, an IV pole and a comfortable room. We, you see, we have the beach motif. I'm at the beach. So, um, and a really dedicated nurse. The key is really the most important aspect of this room is the nurse. The nurse who does all the pre the pre education and is really in that room for a period of time during, you know, before, during, and afterwards to really talk to these patients and let them know about why they're getting the care that they're getting, why they're getting the treatment, how the treatment works in layperson's terms, and most importantly, the, you know, what to expect afterwards and what's the follow-up going to be. But let me stop with that. What do you guys... Yeah, so I, we'll touch on this a little bit as we go through the, the balance of the talk, but I, I think it's an excellent point. And... Um, you know, our, our infusion suite is, is uh, you know, a little bit uh, different based on our geographic locations of the suite because we're over a large geographic area. And, but I think what, what's Im important to kind of highlight is that the experience wherever they are is exactly the same experience and the infrastructure as it relates to the dedication of the staff is kind of easily reproducible whether that the therapy is given in the greater Philadelphia area or whether it's given in the greater New York area. Some of our suites are very similar to Neil's, where it's a, simply a recliner and an IV pole. And some are, are more sophisticated and more centralized with, with a couple of chairs. But I, I think the, the thread that pulls through is the clinical excellence piece, the uh, staff that supports that patient journey, uh, and having an environment in which they feel comfortable receiving these infusions, uh, you know, irrespective of the, of the overall kind of size of the infusion suite itself. Yeah, <clears throat> I think I would just add, I think one thing that all three of us 
agree with quite strongly on is the, the overarching concept that you don't need a massive amount of infrastructure or new infrastructure to implement these programs. I think if you have a, a practice that has infusion capabilities, if you've had advanced prostate cancer programs, um, utilize your strengths, utilize what you have. Um, that's a very common question is, is, well, how many new people do I need to hire? What, what, what do we need to do? Do we need to break walls down? Um, and the simple answer is no. None of us have done that. Um, we've all utilized what we've had. Uh, and I think that's a pretty common theme of this talk is, is, is that. Yeah, I, I would also add that, you know, from a, an FTE perspective, it can be somewhat FTE light, right? I mean, we can repurpose existing, not to make them sound like driftwood or something, but you, you can kind of reassign roles within the practice to existing advanced practice providers to help support programmatic development. Uh, especially getting gum, and then as you become more robust over time, you may find the need to add additional FTEs. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here we go. Um, it's Gordon. I think, I think this is you, Mike. All right. Thanks, Neil. Excellent, uh, as always. Um, so I'm going to spend the next you know, 25 minutes or so talking about how to operationalize this therapy within our practices. I promise you I won't break into acapella unless it's Broadway in nature. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're going to start off with another kind of ARS question here. So uh, for, the, for the group, what seems to be the biggest barrier to administering uh, checkpoint inhibitors in our current practices? One, uh, we're unfamiliar with the drugs and their indications or utilization. Two, we have logistical concerns around the infusions, how to administer them, uh, space required, et cetera. Thirdly, side effect management concerns, whether that's us individually as, as providers, whether that's as the, to the practice as a whole. Uh, and then economic concerns. Are there economic concerns around reimbursement practices, revenue cycle management issues, um, cash flow issues within the practice, uh, on-label approvals, et cetera? Or lastly, uh, none of the above. The last uh, ARS question here is going to be um, an understanding of USP 800 will allow our practices to, one, uh, provide cheaper acquisition costs from uh, distributors of the existing therapeutics, two, uh, ensure a safe environment to help protect their staff against hazardous drugs, three, better manage side effects of checkpoint inhibitors. And lastly, bill for the drug I'm more successful in. Were we able to see the responses to the first question? For some reason, it didn't come up. Is there a way we can go back to that? Yeah, usually there's a response. Here you go. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So uh, this is, a, I think, an important concept and one that, that Tom will, will I, I think, certainly highlight in the context of this, of this talk. Um, side effect management, either, you know, from an from a individual doctor perspective, getting up and running, or if it's not for the, you know, urologic oncologist or, you know, disease matter uh, subject expert within the practice, maybe to the partners on call. We'll talk about how to manage that and how pathways can uh, help you know, mitigate some of that, uh, that, that concern. Uh, I, I think that that's uh, certainly something which will be, uh, you know, as we use these more effectively, you'll find that there's, I think, fairly straightforward ways to identify these patients. And as Neil alluded to, uh, ways that we can very effectively manage these side effects uh, and within our wheelhouse on a very consistent basis. And we should feel comfortable doing so as, as you know, kind of thoughtful, engaged, uh, just uh, generally practicing urologist without any necessarily additional training uh, required. All right. So, uh, you know, Dr. Short you know, did, did an excellent job, as always, really kind of highlighting and, and under, underlining the, the clinical benefits to the use of immunotherapies, you know, within our clinical practices. 
to uh, improve outcomes in, in patients with various urologic conditions, you know, whether it be um, bladder, or prostate, or renal. Um, and really, the goal in the next you know, several slides is to try to understand how we're going to, um, how, how we're going to operationalize these programs and bring them in-house to our existing urology practices to, you know, uh, allow our patients in the real world um, to uh, gain a benefit from the utilization of an immuno-oncology clinic. Um, and, and so we've identified, you know, kind of four pillars uh, or four essen essential elements of a really robust uh, and effective immunotherapy clinic. And we're going to go through these in, in much more detail in subsequent slides, but it really starts with um, kind of a discussion around uh, shared buy-in. And, you know, there are two major stakeholders in this initially to drive programmatic change, one being a physician champion, uh, somebody who really wants to continue to deliver integrated care uh, uh, along the, the disease continuum for a specific disease state, uh, and who wants to kind of start immunoinfusions within the practice. Secondly is going to be the administrative champion, somebody who administratively, usually on a CMO or a CEO level, is able to um, help us um, kind of further operationalize this from a, uh, a financial perspective as well as from an infrastructure uh, investment perspective to make sure that uh, you know, we're doing this effectively and thoughtfully and, and successfully. Um, and it, it's these two kind of initial champions which are going to drive subsequent process change within practices. Um, and as you can see, you know, we're going to talk about the provider. What's required from a provider perspective? You know, is this a, you know, and there's providers is a very broad term. It includes physicians, it includes mid-levels, it includes nurse navigation, in my opinion. And in my opinion, it also includes the, the insurance benefits verification people, the folks that actually allow our patients to get access to these therapies. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit in depth about the patient identification, some of the challenges associated with that, and, and some of the barriers that we may uh, see from internal referrals uh, within our, our, uh, our clinics. We're going to talk about the, the benefits of pathway-driven care, uh, the efficiencies inherent within, within pathways, and how to develop pathways for specific disease states, um, and, and try to get rep uh, you know, reproducible care, whether that care is given in the greater Philadelphia or the greater New York area. And talk about really, you know, the minimal infrastructure and physical plant requirements, which which are going to underlie the, um, you know, the development of successful uh, IO therapy clinics. The slides really kind of highlight, I think, the uh, underlying uh, tenants uh, of, a, of, a, of providers, including champions, physicians, navigators, uh, data analysts, um, all driven by pathway uh, uh, driven care and highlighted by. Uh, kind of uh, data analytics along the way to kind of pressure test to make sure that we're actually doing the things that we think we're doing, providing the appropriate care and the appropriate patient along the way. All right, so but what are some of the barriers, you know, to, to get this up and running? Well, you know, as we alluded to earlier, you know, one of the, we're going to have to have kind of two drivers of change within, within individual practices. That one, first driver of change is going to be that, that champion physician, the other one being an, an administrative champion. Um, these uh, two individuals are going to have to drive cultural and infrastructural change along the practice itself. And I think this is probably one of the most important um, kind of stumbling points for any individual practice getting up and running to whether it be um, you know, an APC, an ABC, or an ACC, as Neil described to having these um, you know, pr um, programs be successful uh, it is really the required change in the practice culture. So I think it has to start with a discussion around the clinical excellence piece and around the, the data that, that Dr. Short presented um, and educate our, our partners around that need, around the, um, the changes in practice and, and the clinical benefits to delivering these therapies within practices. Um, and then it's gonna be followed up with a, um, a discussion around um, that, you know, transitioning these patients from patients of individual doctors to patients of the practice. So we're going to be taking these patients away from a patient of Gordon's or Neil's or Tom's to now being a patient of our practice. And that's not to say that these patients aren't going to have a relationship with their referring or existing urologist, but it's to say that to make this successful, we can't have the, the referring uh, uh, urologist undermine the process of internal referral. I think, I think that, uh, that, that cultural change is going to be a very important one and one that's essential 
to, to successful programs uh, that, that, we're, that we're referring to. Let me <clears throat> just ask you guys, because I think this is a big piece here. <clears throat> Neil, what's been your experience with that kind of model of group referral? You know, we've talked about an AP, and I think all of us have some double vision on this because we've seen an APCs pan out too. You know, if you build it, they will come. Is that applicable? Do, do you find that your, your, your colleagues and your partners, once they've seen that there is a, a disease state expert or an expert that has a, a certain expertise, can attract patients, you know, easily from other colleagues? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, and it's, I, I wish I could say the answer is an unequivocal yes. Unfortunately, it's not because there are a lot of factors that go into play um, as it relates to the physician referral, it's complex. There are those physicians within your own group who will say, I don't, I don't, I don't wanna take care of these patients because I'm focusing on complicated stone disease or complicated um, LUTs or complicated ED or infertility or pediatric urology and they're very happy to refer to someone like yourself or Gordon, Tom, and they're thrilled that they have it in-house and that they have expertise and they don't want to have leakage to outside the institution. Double entendre, we can use the word <laughs> leakage as urologist. It's always fun to throw that in. But then unfortunately, and here's sort of the, the, the challenging part, you know, we have colleagues who may recognize that it's, they can't, they can't keep up they don't know, they don't have the knowledge, and they're, they don't send it in, internally because to one of us because maybe there's a, there's a disincentivization economically. Maybe there is an issue regarding ego and autonomy or, and politics. And, and I think that's one of the things that we have struggled with, but we're doing so much better with it. And that's really where it's about leadership, it's about culture, um, it's about education, and it's about listening to why there would be a, um, some hesitancy to internally refer. Um, I think once you can establish that you, are, you have someone in, the, in your organization who is truly committed, who is following the literature, um, and you know the whole issue around economic incentivization, disincentivization can be very complex. Sometimes there are geographical barriers, Less so if you're in a, a smaller organization. I mean, you know, Gordon, you know, his, his group's throughout the entire state of New Jersey. And so there can be geographical barriers to entry, and so putting the satellites in that can do things well. Uh, and it's, a, it's an ongoing work in progress, Tom. Um, and you know, we continue to, you know, to try and do the best we can. And it's not to say we can't incorporate uh, you know, surrounding medical oncologists, well, both within the community and, and academia. My goal, as I said in the beginning, is to have it all um, in-house and to do it as well as we can. But these are some of the things that we struggle with. Uh, and, I, you know, I, for our overseas colleagues who are listening, I realize there's a lot of different reimbursement methodologies for the physician, the healthcare provider, and also for the payers. So it's, we're all in this together. Again, it's all about convenience and excellence of care for the patient, and hopefully that will ultimately win the day. Yeah, I, I would add that, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think ego and financial disincentivation to internal referrals are, are two big issues that, that we struggle with. Um, certainly, I think bringing this discussion directly to the partners as, prospectively as opposed to um, kind of hoping things will, will change over time is, is probably the most direct way to address this prospectively. Um, and then once you have group buy-in, at least our experience has been that this goes from, from more of a, of a forced model where you're kind of prospectively identifying patients and bringing them into centers of excellence to very much of a passive model, as Neil described, where you know, you're having uh, you know, people identify appropriate patients and sending them in. Um, you know, very early on in their disease course, which is really both the practices as well as the, you know, the patient's benefit. Um, I would further add that, you know, once you do have a successful culture, and something that we've, you know, has been going, is that as you grow and evolve over time, 
it's really important to translate that cultural success locally to global sites, right? So uh, across war large geographic areas that might be disparate or over a larger number of providers um, such that um, you don't lose some of the initial traction that you gain and some of the programmatic benefits that, that are gonna be translated to your patients. So I think that maintaining a, a successful culture as that practice grows and evolves as we all are you know, pretty consistently now in urology, I think is a very important underlying uh, you know, concern as well. Yeah, <clears throat> great, and, and I would just add that um, <clears throat> I think things are getting better in this, in this respect, I think. Um, Trainees are coming out um, a little bit more, um, like Neil said, that they're, they want to be disease uh, experts, um, and they realize that, you know, you can't do everything really well. Certainly in the community, all of us wear a few different hats, and we're all, to a certain degree, general urologists, despite our advanced training. Um, but I, I think with the younger generation um, and, and, and the younger kind of breed of trainees, I think that this is, is getting better. And, and in our group, which is a, a slanted a little bit younger, we, we, I think one of the strengths of our group is having this kind of culture where, where people are, are very happy to send things in. Um, and like Gordon said, there are some, some components about incentivization and, and, and how things work at the end of the, uh, of the day. But <clears throat> it's fundamentally a, a, a practice culture thing that needs to be identified to make this work because one or two providers cannot make this program, you know, run by themselves. Can I just piggyback to that? You know, I, I made this point the other day um, during the IBCG, um, oh no, it was during the IPF, and, and the concept was, uh, and I just want to echo what Tom just said, I, and, and I, I don't want to be uh, generationally biased, but I guess I will be, and I'll say that the younger generation, you can you can define how younger is. It's, it's anybody who's not a baby boomer um, <laughs> are much more, as a general rule, collaborative. They're more collaborative. They're more emphasis on the team. The, the baby boomer population are the ones who went to pre-med, med school, where they, they got the sort of the mantra, look to the left, look to the right. You know, one of you is never going to get into medical school. And then you go to residency. It's like, look to the left, look to the right. You're not going to get a fellowship, or so you know. There was really a lot. It was very, very competitive and very um, uh, not an emphasis on collaboration. And so I completely agree with what Tom was saying. Is that the younger generations are infinitely more collaborative. They understand the importance of really patient first as opposed to provider, person, physician first. And I'm very optimistic about that. Now, semicolon. What I brought up at the IPF yesterday in the advanced prostate cancer milieu, and I think the same is true in advanced bladder and kidney cancer, and this concerns me, is there's a tremendous growth in, in, the, in the urologic community, and not just in the US. Our colleagues in Italy are very aggressive about this, and in Germany and, and, and Japan, which I think is great, is uro-oncologist understanding systemic therapy. But if you look at the educational programs in the US, I won't speak for non-US, the urology residents and fellows are not getting training in advanced systemic therapies. And so that is very concerning to me. And the irony is when they go to take their boards, they're asked all these questions about IO therapy, and they're asked all these questions about systemic therapy and geo-oncology, and they're getting the training when they come to the community. If they stay in academia, there's real, you know, uh, 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 red lines where you, the urologists are still following, I think, I don't, apologies for any of the co my colleagues in academia who are doing a better job of this than what I'm portraying, but it's still largely a surgical oncologic field in academia. We have colleagues who understand the literature and are part of papers, and they become trial sites, but it's the medical oncologist who are actually doing that touch point. And I think it's great that the AUA and, you know, and Tom doing this course for us, this is what we need to continue to do because it gets back to, you can't just know about something, you gotta be able to 
be directly involved with it. So, so that's kind of a, an, a, a, an odd irony that's happening right now in training and then for those who come out into the community. All right, so um, another potential barrier being the, the USP 800. Yeah, for, for those who, who may not be familiar, this is a set really of, of rules and, and regulations which is outlined by the federal government and uh, administered by the National Institutes on Occupational Safety and Health, which, which really gives us an understanding as to how to, you know, receive, store, handle, uh, reconstitute, uh, administer, um, and dispose of, of hazardous drugs. Um, and, you know, within that there are, are, are three kind of classes of hazardous drugs, uh, the first class including um, anti-neoplastic therapies. Uh, my current understanding, you know, is that uh, immunotherapy is not, you know, included in the USP 800 indications currently, um, and that uh, this is really meant to, um, you know, protect, you know, those people who are kind of handling, storing, and administering it from from safety concerns around around the the, the patient care model where they're going to be delivering these therapies and make sure they're doing it safely. Um, so uh, you also have to kind of understand some of the challenges which can be existent with, with site-specific reimbursement issues and revenue cycle management. Nothing will undermine the development of a successful IO clinic more than uh, doing it at a loss or, um, you know, kind of running at a revenue neutral kind of proposition based on infrastructure um, and perceived at least clinical risk. Um, so it's important that our, our administrative champion help us navigate the, you know, those waters. It's important that they understand the local payer mix. Uh, a lot of these therapies are buy and bill therapies, so we have to understand the expected turnaround to reimbursement after administration and, and what that uh, you know, percent above purchase price might be to help us make sure this is going to be a financially viable uh, endeavor. Certainly, uh, that can't be done in a vacuum, and you know, we have to understand there may be uh, you know, different reimbursement based on whether these therapies are given in the hospital setting, uh, the, the clinic setting, or, or as an at-home infusion. Uh, and really the goal here is not to undermine the relationships with our, with our medical oncology colleagues, but rather to foster them, right, and that the, the, the patient is at the center of this care model. The goal here is really to practice multidisciplinary care and deliver these therapies safely and efficiently within our existing practices on, on, uh, with on-label indications and in clinical trials when appropriate. These patients certainly may require medical oncology intervention at some point during their care model, so we're not looking to undermine, you know, long-standing either, you know, personal or professional relationships with our medical oncology colleagues, but rather foster them uh, really for the benefit of our, of our patients. So, um, well, I, maybe, we, Gordon, before you finish, I do want to hear, you know, one, the, the models are, are different across the country and really across this table in terms of how these are delivered. Um, Neil's practice and my practice, we, we deliver these ourselves, um, you know, with the kind of the champion urologist model. And Gordon's practice, they have an in-house medical oncologist so um, to do this. And that's becoming a, a very popular model to bring in a GU medical oncologist either on a part-time or a full-time basis to both administer these therapies and help uh, with clinical trial uh, support. So um, I do want to touch on that before you switch out. Um, about how, what, what your thoughts are on that model and, and how that's been viable. Yeah, so I, I appreciate you, you kind of highlighting that. You know, from our perspective, um, we actually started with the urologist infusing this, and the volumes became such, um, and the geographic diversity became such, that we had to really bring in additional providers, and we felt that it, at least in the, the region where they were, they felt more comfortable really hiring a medical oncologist to administer that, that therapy. So we, we went uh, and hired a full-time medical oncologist um, to oversee and run um, kind of the, the northern portion of our practice, which is about 80 miles north of where I am currently. Um, and, and so uh, he, in that context, will um, has an infusion suite, um, which is much nicer than, <laughs> than, than mine, um, but nonetheless, uh, and, and really oversees the, the care of these patients. Um, it, it's a very collegial and collaborative, you know, kind of endeavor, quite honestly. It's one that we have shared grand rounds, we have shared tumor boards, um, and, and it's something that um, the group up there felt more comfortable bringing somebody in-house uh, uh, for, for their kind of immediate needs. So that, that he probably services um, 
uh, I would say 60 to 70 percent of our practice from an IO perspective, chemotherapy and oral oncolytic for uh, you know advanced RCC, prostate and bladder um, in, in appropriate indications. Um, so he's because of that, he's obviously a very busy person um, and will require you know other people kind of ultimately underneath him uh, as we continue to grow and evolve. We continue to you know kind of do our our own little thing down in in the south in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, where I'm kind of, you know, maintaining a, a practice with infusions. Um, but that may be changing, frankly, too, because now, you know, I'm kind of servicing 30-plus uh, uh, urologists referring into us, and frankly, you know, um, I'm not giving systemic chemotherapy, and we see the need to kind of expand that, that infusion line. So we're looking to hire our own full-time medical oncologist down there to kind of bolster that, that referral base. Yeah, and I think the, the point is, is local local service lines, local politics are different, right? Each of us have different geographical setups. Um, we have a very intimate relationship in our setting with a, with a big medical oncology group um, that we collaborate with quite strongly. Um, and, and so, y you know, one size doesn't fit all here. Um, but certainly, whether you do it, you, you decide to bring it in-house or you decide to bring someone else in, it's getting to the point, as Neil said, where there's so much going on that, that really everybody who's a stakeholder in GU cancer care in your group should really be uh, aware of what's going on and, and what the pop-off uh, levers are to get these patients to the right person um, to, to get them treated and evaluated. Yeah, I, I think that that's maybe the most important point, uh, Tom, is that you know, we don't want to not treat these patients, right, So uh, or under-treat them based on the, on the lack of either willingness to do it ourselves or in-house support to do it. We want to you know, kind of refer them when appropriate to, to support and, and certainly not under-treat. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about, about providers. And this is kind of a, a broad topic, um, but really um, is inclusive of a variety of different, uh, you know, uh, em employees within the practice including both, both physicians, APNs, uh, infusion nurses, uh, nurse navigators, et cetera. So as we've kind of alluded to along the way here, this champion physician, and my kind of general rule for champion doctors is that's about one doctor for every kind of 10 partnered urologists. I think it's a, generally speaking is a nice uh, mix. This is generally speaking a, a um, somebody who may be urologic oncology fellowship trained, but certainly by no means needs to be. They can just be a high volume surgeon who has a you know, specific disease state expert interest um, and has developed their practice throughout the course of their, of their um, uh, practice life to kind of focus on, on specific disease states, whether it be bladder, prostate, or renal. Um, and, and, and that they want to now expand their practice base to you know, give integrated care uh, from an infusion IO perspective within their existing urology practice. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, obviously these patients, or pardon me, obviously these physicians have kind of usually ample internal referral uh, sources built into the, um, their already day-to-day uh, -day practice surgically, but now they're looking to kind of expand that, that, uh, that footprint and, and deliver IOs. Now, with this transition, you know, there may be multiple champions required depending upon the size and geographic disparity of the practice. And I think, you know, the biggest thing to being a champion physician is, I think, the desire and the drive to actually do it, okay? There's no kind of uh, intellectual secret sauce, nothing that is, um, uh, I think, uh, insurmountable as it relates to the data and understanding it and the application and management of this patient population. We have to have the need or the desire or the want to, to do it. And I think trying to tap into those people within your practice will allow um, the development of champions geographically to be uh, a much easier process and benefit not only the patient but, but, but programmatic development uh, to a much greater extent. And, and as these you know, doctors become champions, their time is going to be utilized quite differently, right? Um, they're going to require direct oversight of, of their mid-level providers. They're going to have to help navigate patients along pathways. They're going to have to review AEs, labs, scans, have real-time interaction with nurse navigation to identify appropriate internal referrals. Um, and you know, they're going to have to have much more complicated discussions um, with these patients, right? Now, th these are going to have to be much more complicated, not only disease state discussions, they're going to have much more complicated you know, therapeutic discussions around therapeutic choices, including ongoing clinical trials research within the practice. 
um, they're going to have to have a, a very robust AE discussion. Um, and, and when appropriate, sometimes end-of-life discussions, uh, which are really not that kind of prototypical, uh, you know, 99213, five years out from radical prostate with a native PSA and he's dry with good erections, we are tapping them on the butt um, and getting them out the door. So we're going to have to provide for that, that time for, for these doctors to be happy doing this and to be successful doing it. Um, and I think that, that that is a very important, important point. Um, you know, and equally as important as the doctor and development of the doctor uh, champion, frankly, maybe even more important in some cases are going to be the development of a good chemo nurse uh, and, a, and a strong a mid-level provider to help um, further kind of support uh, not only patient care, um, but uh, oversee the AE management a lot of times and identify patients, uh, you know, to, uh, to kind of get them from uh, intake into a specific disease state and actually start it on infusional therapies. Uh, you know, in, in my practice, for example, when, you know, we identify somebody, you know, to get Pembro for, for uh, BCG refractory and then IBC, we may see that, that I may see that patient a third as much, for example, as my <laughs> infusion nurse and, and as my mid-level does. And I'm seeing them maybe as initial intake, and I might not see them until week nine or 12 when we're following, you know, getting following up uh, uh, interval cystoscopy for surveillance, uh, assuming they've had an uncomplicated course. However, they've seen them every three weeks with, with my, you know, infusion nurse as well as my, my APP. Um, so I, I think that, that having, again, people who are motivated and committed to that process is an important concept and have the personality to interact with these patients and support them along their journey uh, is, is an important uh, uh, individual to find. Um, navigation is another piece here which has to be, I think, recognized. And as we alluded to earlier, these roles can be somewhat hybrid in nature, especially when you're starting out, right? The, these roles, uh, you know, when you look at FTE requirements from an infrastructure perspective, you can have APPs who, you know, act, function as data analysts or, or navigators, and you can have, you know, infusion nurses who do the same. So the, the ability or the need, I should say, to hire a bunch of different new staff, I think is very limited to get the, when getting these programs up and running uh, effectively. Um, and, and the navigation is uh, an essential, it's the cornerstone to all successful patient identification. The navigation, and we'll talk about you know, how we identify patients in, in a minute here, but, but these navigators are really the ones that are coming to us on a weekly basis. You know, I meet with my team twice a week by phone, once a week in person. That in-person discussion really is one that's around, uh, you know, identifying potential eligible patients for ongoing clinical trials, looking at uh, potential patients to be navigated into our center, and a review of ongoing treatments, AEs, those types of things within our existing infusion patient population or advanced cancer patient population. And these navigators are, are critical, um, you know, and their ability to kind of sift through the data that exists within our EMRs and do that effectively for us is a critical component to, to bringing these patients successfully into, into robust clinics. And then the last piece, which I, which I mentioned earlier when I started, um, was the insurance and benefits verification folks. Um, you know, this is something which didn't make the slide. And, um, but nonetheless, it is, an, is a cornerstone also of having a successful program in as much as, you know, if we can't very efficiently and effectively uh, get patients started on, on treatment, you know, uh, while getting them benefits verified, um, that's going to be a stumbling point, right? These patients, if they, if they can't get access to these therapies for whatever reason, they're not going to pay out of pocket for them. Um, so these folks are folks that are going to, help us make sure that these patients get the appropriate therapy for the appropriate patient in a timely fashion. Uh, and they're as critical a part of the team as, as any of the rest of us are. Okay. Um, Can I just let's make one quick? Yeah. So great, great review here, Gordon. So awesome. So it's the three, three, three comments. One is the notion around clinical trials. You, I, I think this is a, just a gateway opportunity for sites that have volume, have scale, have passion, once they start doing the, 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 the approved therapies, they become great uh, potential sites to do clinical research if they're not already doing it. You know, we've gone in the last six years to having more trials now in geo-oncology than we have sites. It's a real challenge for our colleagues uh, in biopharma because we, we need more 
quality sites. And if you become a really high performing clinical site for approved treatment, then it's just a, such a simpler way to then segue into becoming a clinical research site, which is the ultimate physician scientist goal to advance healthcare, period. So that's a great point that you put in there. The second thing, from a payer standpoint, is by offering uh, optimal care, you know, meaning to the right patient, right time, with the right team to avoid and manage toxicities, which Tom's gonna to talk about in a second. Why is that important? Well, number one, it's great for patients, but number two, you keep patients out of the emergency department and out of the inpatient hospital system. Those are the two biggest health economic outcome drains in all healthcare systems, not just in the US. So if you manage these patients really well with the right team that Gordon's just you know, really gone into in a lot of granularity, keep people out of the ED, keep them out of the hospital. And, then pay, and, and what patient doesn't like that, especially during COVID? And then third, and I think this is a really important point, and I think, I think it used to be kind of a third rail for urologists when we'd start to talk about palliative care or hospice care. Uh, I will tell you that some of the most amazing moments for me as a physician is in end of life care. And it is for my healthcare team too. I never thought I'd be saying that as a urologic surgeon. And I think a lot of urologic surgeons are like, oh, I can't deal with that. You know, a lot of medical oncologists have a really hard time with it too. If you read JCO, Art of Oncology, there's some amazing editorials there. And to me, that's one of the most um, incredible experiences and it's an enormous privilege for the entire healthcare team that you have to deal with people who are on the, you know, the night side of life with a diagnosis of cancer. I, I think it's something that needs to be embraced. It's, it can be an mo incredibly beautiful thing. And you learn to work well with your um, palliative care services and your hospice care services. It's an ongoing evolution, super, super important. Yeah, I'll just <clears throat> chime in one thing. Um, you know, the finances are something that's frequently asked about. Um, and, and I, you know, we'd certainly have time to talk more about it, um, but I, I'll just chime in that, you know, the primary revenue is fine. I, I think it keeps the lights on in the program. It, it supports the staff, it supports the program. But really, the piece is a bigger piece for a cancer center model. It's a bigger center, it's a bigger piece for a programmatic model in that the revenue in the secondary lines, and we've all talked about this, and I think agree with this, is, is what can really drive the decision to do this. Is, is, um, it's gonna augment all aspects of your bladder cancer program. It's gonna augment your prostate cancer program. Um, it's gonna augment your genetic profiling program um, to be able to offer this. And, and with that comes, I think, a lot of secondary, um, both visibility gains for the practice and the cancer center, uh, and financial gains. So, you know, the the, the primary gain, you know, it's it, the, the, these are fairly expensive drugs and it's ASP plus six, and so, you know, you, you'll get something back on this, but all of us know that, that there's also financial liability, right, in case some of those claims take a little bit of time to come back. Um, so it, it's generally, uh, I think, a stable financial proposition, um, or stable to good in, in terms of, of the fact that it supports the program. Um, but really, the, the, to me, the bigger catch here is the secondary gains of, of, of having the program be enhanced and having all of your related service lines be enhanced. All right, excellent discussion. So let's uh, let's move on to, to patient ID. And we talked about this, uh, you know, I think a little bit, uh, you know, already. But we'll kind of highlight some of the some of the you know salient points here as, as we go along. The patient ID, you know, I think this is where we're going to see benefits uh, paid off to our previous kind of changes around cultural uh, uh, modification within our practices and how we function. And having these, these patients really now be patients of the practice as a whole as opposed to an individual physician's patient. Uh, this process can be as, as, as simplified or as complex as you choose to make it, quite honestly. Um, this is really going to be the, the, the wheelhouse of our patient navigators and our data analysts, uh, which are going to you know, go into our existing EMR structures and look to identify appropriate pool of patients 
who are at high risk of developing specific disease states. You know, for example, those patients who have high risk NMIBC, who um, you know may have uh, received BCG therapy, who are looking for the BCG refractory patient to make them eligible for for use of, of, of Pembro based on the uh, Kino 57 data. Um, we can also, uh, you know, have different groups of patients that we look at, um, and meaning that, you know, that intake could potentially be um, all high-risk NMIBC. It could be just patients receiving BCG, or it could be as finite as just those, um, you know, looking with a, uh, with a BCG refractory diagnosis. As a general rule, we try to cast a little bit of a wider net and then kind of narrow it down as we go along. Uh, there are... Uh, you know, kind of this can be done manually or it can be more of an automated process. Um, we started out, frankly, looking at CPT codes and, and, you know, at the time, injection codes and, and previous therapy codes when we started doing this in prostate, you know, a little over 10 years ago. And um, we've become a lot more sophisticated over time, but it can be done with just kind of uh, hammering out some of the EMR data which currently exists. There are services out there which will provide uh, for a fee, uh, either direct nurse, uh, nurse navigation or data analytics. There are also uh, existing uh, computer-based platforms which can go over your existing EMR. There are natural language learning platforms which will search for keywords within a, a, your entire patient base and will you know, uh, grab your um, uh, potential eligible candidates based on, on specific uh, filters which you put in. Um, these are not perfect, but they're much more efficient than, than going in and kind of trying to do these uh, individually. I think specifically, you know, as, as it relates to the bladder cancer patient population, the BCG shortage has actually helped us here. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, what, what, what Neil and Tom think, but, but from my perspective, um, you know, we keep a, a pretty concise BCG log now, much more so than we have historically. Uh, for, for two main reasons. One, we want to make sure that the people who actually, um, well, let me take a step back. BCG utilization <laughs> has been really all over the map historically. Um, and so the BCG shortage really has had two intended consequences within our practice. One, it's really made the patients who truly always really needed BCG to actually get BCG, um, as opposed to those, you know, as opposed to being a little bit of a wider swath. Two, we've been able to more accurately and, and very effectively oversee the administration of BCG to make sure it's actually being delivered appropriately. Uh, and thirdly, it really has allowed us to have kind of a finite list of potential eligible patients for either clinical trial enrollment or, or use of, of PEMBRO based on the 057 data. Um, so uh, those are kind of unintended consequence uh, of a therapeutic shortage, which has actually benefited, I think, programmatic development and makes you know, patient identification a little bit more um, uh, simplified, certainly in, in, this, in this context. Um, I'm not sure if you have any, any comments about that, but you know, I, so I think um, we can exploit sometimes some of these uh, you know, um, therapeutic shortages to benefit our patients, uh, uh, to get them on to, um, to therapies which are gonna improve their outcomes. Um, and there is, as I, as I mentioned earlier, a significant crossover between clinical trials research and patients uh, in, in advanced stages of their disease or refractory to first and second line therapies who may be IO eligible. Um, and that, you know, we kind of constantly review this patient population for clinical trial enrollment and have, have a real commitment to the development and support of clinical trials research whenever possible to help advance uh, patient care. Pathways. So from a pathway perspective, um, this is the concept here, as everybody knows, is really to try to deliver um, reproducible, guideline-driven care efficiently uh, throughout the, uh, an individual organization, such that it, you know, they're going to have the same care um, and same experience in the greater Philadelphia area in my practice as they would in the greater New York area. Um, that, uh, that's uh, going to require a fair amount of coordination. Um, and th these pathways are going to be, you know, kind of an overarching disease state pathway for those patients with high-risk NMIBC, um, but also gets as granular as, you know, a pathway for these patients when they actually come in for their individual infusions, all right? So I know with a high degree of confidence that they're going to have the same experience. They're going to come in. They're going to have a patient identification. They'll have a bracelet put on, which much like a center, uh, surgical center bracelet. They'll go back, they'll meet with my infusion nurse, they'll have their labs reviewed, they'll have their scans reviewed if appropriate, review AEs if appropriate um, based on, um, on prior infusions. 
they'll, if appropriate, they'll get their infusion, they'll, they'll remain there and then have an assessment of any AEs and then be discharged. I know that for every patient that comes through, they're gonna have that exact same experience. Um, and the patients might not like me all that much, but they universally love my, my mid-levels and my infusion nurses. So they really are the, the kind of the mortar that holds this whole thing together for me and allows pull through from me identifying them to, to them progressing it, uh, or, or, or not, you know, hopefully. Um, so uh, I, I think the, the pathways also allow us to have some confidence that we're not missing windows of therapeutic opportunity, right? That we're not missing a window to deliver FDA approved therapies to patients uh, that could benefit them. And it allows a standardization of care which kind of ensures that from happening. It helps us identify and manage AEs um, and kind of oftentimes troubleshoot them. Um, and and uh, so I think from a pathway perspective, it, the pathways may be a little bit different based on the practice, but they're all gonna be based on, on, on published guidelines uh, and how that pathway is administered, how it's overseen and how it's kind of pressure tested may be, uh, may evolve, you know? So the pathway now may be a little bit different than the pathway in six months from now. I think that it has to be a, a kind of a living, breathing document, which, which is kind of reassessed as new data co comes onto the scene. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna finish up. This is a, <laughs> a picture of my infusion suite, <laughs> uh, much like Neil's. Uh, I don't have any beautiful pictures on the wall, um, but it's New Jersey, so I mean, there's not, <laughs> it's not much beautiful in New Jersey, I guess. So, uh, you know, we have, we have an infusion suite. Um, you know, the, 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 I think the concept and the general theme here is, is that the amount of infrastructure investment from a materials perspective is really minimal, all right? This is not a huge financial investment or, or, or overly sophisticated infusion facility. Um, this can be done, I have a, a similar lounge chair with an infusion pole. It can be done within our existing uh, 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 plant um, and, and offices. This is an office uh, exam room in one of our offices and it kind of like has a threefold like, you know, uh, infusion for radiopharmaceuticals, infusions for immunotherapies, and infusion for a variety of other things on and, on and off trial. Um, and, and, and so uh, the USP 800 really isn't gonna be applicable as it relates to IO therapies. However, if you do expand your, your, your uh, program to include specifically you know, systemic chemotherapies, you're gonna have to make some additional infrastructure investment as it relates to you know, hoods and, and, and specific storage facilities for reconstitution uh, administration and disposal purposes to be compliant with USP 800. So um, I think with that, we're gonna transition over to Tom and we're gonna have a discussion uh, can we hit uh, play on this video? Uh, this is yeah. kind of take two on the video scene. This is my nurse. Oh, go back one. Okay. Hi, I'm Lauren Ball. I'm the nurse practitioner here at Urology Associates, um, and I give all the infusions. So just wanted to discuss a little bit about um, what a day looks like here. So what happens is we go get the patient out of the waiting room. They come back into our infusion room. Um, this is it. So, pretty simple. You don't need too much. Um, just have the recliner there in the pump. So, they will come back and I'll just kind of touch base with them, see how they're doing, see how they're feeling since their last infusion, if there's new, any new side effects. Um, we'll get their vitals and then I'll start an IV, just a simple IV. Then I'll go mix their medication with some normal saline and then come in and start their IV, which is given over 30 minutes. Um, there's usually never any side effects or any infusion reactions. And then afterwards, I grab Dr. J. Ram and he comes in and speaks with them about when their ne next labs will be your next scan. Um, and then unhook them and usually either they need labs every two to three months, so sometimes we'll get that. And then I'll set them up for their next telehealth visit, which is every three weeks, and their infusion is every six weeks. Lauren, uh, tell us about the mixing. Is that hard? Is it a big pain? Do you have to do it in a special room? Yeah, so it's really simple. The, um, the Keytruda and the Optivo both come um, and they're stored in the refrigerator. And then for the Optivo, you have to mix it with 112 cc's of normal saline and the Keytruda is with 200. So you just need to pull out so that you have those, those amounts and then um, draw up the medicine in a syringe and mix it. So it takes about five minutes. All right, so then after the patient's done um, and we've kind of we've reviewed their course and their treatment plan, 
um, what's the what's the follow-up form yeah so um, then Kelly our scheduler will usually schedule them for a three-week telehealth um, which I do all of those so I call them and just see how they're doing touch base are they having any side effects do we need to call in any medications and then she sets them up for their next infusion in six weeks for the Keytruda and four weeks for the Opti bill great and then um, what at what point does the doctor kind of get involved um, in this process or um, you know, when did when does the doctor yeah, so generate usually, the Yeah, so usually I'll go get the patient, get their vitals, go ahead and get their IV started and get their infusion running, and then I'll go and grab Dr. J. Ram, and then he comes in and, and speaks with the patient, and then um, I kind of follow up the end of their infusion. Okay, great. And then, um, yeah, and then usually after the infusion, um, you know, we, we'll review their um, they're either their labs, their scans, or their you know need for a cystoscopy if it's bladder cancer, um, and then we'll make sure that that gets plugged in so that patients may have to have a holiday to get a cysto, they may have to have a holiday to get a scan, um, and then once all that information's in, we review all of that those results with the patient, make sure that we're on the right track, yep. and we keep going. Sounds good. Overall, um, Lauren, would you say that the patient experience is pretty easy? Are yeah. patients really burdened when they come through? Are they having a hard time getting through it? Yeah, I think it's pretty easy, especially because the infusions are only 30 minutes. So I try to get them in and out, at least within an hour, maybe a little bit more if they need labs. But I feel like it's pretty easy and we try to make the follow-up easy for them as well. Yeah, and we do maybe three, four of these every Friday, right? Yeah. And we just use the same room, really. Yeah, same room. Um, and uh, it's not like we take up equipment. equipment or we don't take up a ton of space. And nope. It's not like patients are waiting around forever. No. Okay. Awesome. Well, Lauren's a pro. She's been helping us really build and develop this program. And so um, uh, it's been, uh, it, it's it's really something that, that we've realized uh, is very doable in an ambulatory center yeah. like this. Great. So you, you can tell I was kind of fishing for, you know, for her to re reiterate that it wasn't, uh, uh, a huge uh, endeavor, but um, okay, so w we'll finish up real quick with some clinical pieces, um, which I think uh, hopefully we'll tie some of this together. Gordon and Neil have done a great job talking about the program, um, and then I'll just touch a little bit on, on really, I, I think, what, what all of us enjoy doing, which is having the patient get efficacy, um, so, so the, the actual, you know, monitoring of the patient and then the side effects. So, um, you know, the, the, the ARS here, and, and I'm going to move a little bit quickly because I, I know everyone wants to get out of here for lunch. What is the biggest barrier to managing adverse events of iotherapy? Um, again, really, and, and we've looked at this uh, from a lot of different organizational levels in, in community practice, there is increasing interest in, in dispensing these and bringing this in-house, but this does seem to be the biggest obstacle. And so within this, you know, what is it that, that is tends to be the most concerning. Is it no formal training, concern with managing patient calls amongst your partners, not comfortable with the steroid piece, um, perceived amount of time and effort needed, or other? So, um, <clears throat> so I'll give us a couple seconds. <clears throat> this is kind of the, the science question that we have to include. So uh, a mini case, which we'll talk a little bit about this at the end, a patient on pembrolizumab for BCG unresponsive CIS develops three days of fatigue, spreading rash that is currently on more than 50% of his body and mild joint pains bilaterally. The next step is to hold the treatment and give topical steroids, to hold the, the treatment, give topical steroids, and initiate oral steroids, hospital admission, and IV infliximab or just to hold the treatment. <clears throat> okay, so um, again, um, the last section of this is, is I think just the, you know, the piece of, of what we're actually doing to this patient. And so Gordon talked about pathway and structure. Um, and, and so I think a big topic or a big thing that's emerged for all of us is, you know, if you're treating this patient, it's not just hitting the button, you know, hitting the infusion pedal on this, you have to understand that these treatments are a little bit different than what we have given in the past. Uh, and, and you have to kind of adjust um, your pathways, the patient's schedule, the, the, the whole process to, to anticipate what can happen, what can go wrong um, from both the disease and a safety standpoint. So, 
you know, just like any treatment we do, just like any surgery we offer, um, the decision should be based on, you know, efficacy um, and individualized, really, from a patient morbidity standpoint. Um, and, you know, and this is a really now common concept in neurologic oncology. What are the options? What are the alternatives of doing nothing? What, what, what are, especially in the adjuvant space, Neil talked about two adjuvant approvals. Um, in, in an adjuvant space, you're technically disease-free, right? You have a risk of recurrence and a high risk of relapse that may improve with therapy, but you are technically disease-free. And so a high level of side effects or a high level of patient bother can't really be tolerated in those situations. And so, you know, you have to discuss active surveillance or doing nothing with the patient. Um, and it's important to understand that every patient is different, um, and, and every patient has kind of a unique therapeutic window of, of, of how they can benefit. So uh, I like to call this kind of, you know, thinking like an oncologist. So, so we're, we're putting on different hats here, but we're, but we're starting to kind of think about things in a 360-degree uh, fashion for this patient. And, and so the things on this slide kind of indicate some of those concepts. Again, not every patient who meets the indication needs treatment, okay, especially um, in, in all of these approved indications that we have, um, sometimes IO is not the best option for these patients. Um, and that's a skill that I think you obtain after treating patients, after seeing how they respond. Um, some patients have better efficacy, some patients have worse tolerability. So <clears throat> not every patient who meets these indications needs treatment. And again, competing risks is, is, is a really you know, common thing now for all of us urooncologists, right, in every disease state localized prostate cancer, what's your expected life, you know, what's your life expectancy? Um, are you going to die of something else? Um, and that's still very important here in terms of giving these treatments. Um, social and family support, I, I can't even exp begin to explain how important I think this is in the community. I mean, you're dealing with patients driving, sometimes by themselves, long distances. You're, you're dealing with patients going home, sometimes to empty houses. Um, and I always, our, part of our intake is who do you live with, how far do you live, is this a huge, you know, burden for you to come, uh, uh, we have a, a, a downtown very urban site that, that pulls from, you know, a pretty big catchment area that includes several rural areas, and so it can often be a big issue, and we, ha you know, we are kind of still working on the, those satellite infusion models. We have a centralized center that does all the infusions. Um, and so that causes some some issues. And, and if I think it's going to be a big issue um, for a patient, I, I'll, I'll tell them that it's probably best not to give therapy. Similar to how I would counsel a patient who, if they were having a cystectomy, um, I'd be much more excited about how that patient's going to do afterwards if I knew they had help, if I knew they had some support at home. Uh, et, et cetera. So um, the social and family support here is important. Um, <clears throat> and then again, I think, you know, this has really emerged for urologists during APCs, um, but the importance of non-cancer health during treatment or non, you know, cancer-related health. So mental health screenings and assessments and, and understanding how patients are doing emotionally, psychologically, um, bone health, nutritional support, a lot of these patients have lost a kidney, they've lost their bladder, they have a urinary diversion. Um, these patients have a lot of needs. And frankly, this has been one of the big arguments for urologists getting into this space. Um, while a patient is there, they can be assessed for a urinary tract infection. They can be assessed for a urologic issue. Their stoma can be assessed by the surgeon. Um, these are things that when they go to medical oncology, they, they don't necessarily get. And so, you know, you try to make it a little bit more of a comprehensive experience for them um, because, again, you know that patient or, the, or you know that what has happened to that patient a little bit better. Um, and then, you know, again, kind of thinking like an oncologist, I think, appropriately manage, managing treatment duration and dose. You know, when you first start doing this, you're going to be very, and I think all of us were, very uh, vetted to the or, 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 or connected to the label and to the schedule and to what you think should happen. This patient should get this every six months or six weeks, and we should do a scan every three weeks. Over time, after you do a lot of this, you start to kind of infuse your own experiences and your own kind of um, expertise into this, and you skip a dose, um, you skip two doses. Um, you know, you get a scan earlier, you get a cysto earlier. Um, 
you know, that's the secret sauce, as Gordon was saying, is, is as you get more and more into this, you become the oncologist, you become the treating doctor. And um, I think that really is uh, a big part of all of this is, you know, not being really, you know, we talk about pathways and pathways are important from an organizational standpoint, but I don't think pathways uh, are really healthy from, you know, a very strict standpoint of we've got to get this patient through one year of treatment. No, you, you, you don't really have to, right? The label on the these trials says a year or two years or three years, um, but get them through four months, get them through six months, see how they do. Um, and, you know, patients always want to know how, lo how much longer do I have to be on this? And, and you can be very honest. Well, as long as you're tolerating it, as long as it's efficacious and as long as you're tolerating it, we can keep doing it. But certainly if that uh, risk benefit breaks down, um, you know, you can divert off of that, uh, that, that stream. So, um, you know, what, what we do, and, and I think more people are starting to do this, <clears throat> patients like this, we hand patients a schedule. And it's not, and it's funny because I just talked about how I don't like strict pathways, but we, we hand patients kind of a what to expect schedule, um, meaning, you know, once we pre-cert and we start on day one, um, your infusions are going to be every six weeks, um, and in, bladder, in NMIBC, you're going to have a telehealth visit every three weeks with our mid-level or the doctor, um, and then you're going to get a cysto roughly every three to four months. Um, and then that changes based on renal cell, based on um, post-cystectomy. Sometimes there's scans uh, put in there. So I think that's important because it helps the patient understand what's going to happen in the next year, what are the expectations, um, and, and, and that I, I think that helps. Um, and again, this is kind of modulated based on disease state. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on kind of clinical monitoring? I mean, I, 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 I'm conflicted on pathways, but I do think something like this helps. Yeah, I, I guess my, my comments would be that uh, I think you have to have a pathway in place, but, but, but be flexible enough to, to kind of modify it along the way it, it for a variety of underlying reasons clinically. But, but I think what's most beneficial here is to outline what the expected course of therapy is for the patients prospectively. And I think that, that that's part of that initial intake discussion, which can be you know, tedious sometimes, but really gives them a roadmap uh, of expected kind of scheduled uh, you know, systos, labs, scans, uh, and also in, in a AE manager if they occur kind of along the way. So I think that gives them a landscape and it, you know as things kind of come up they understand the landscape may be modified appropriately so yeah i i i think this is um uh, how's that uh, yeah I, I patients are always asking uh well how long am i going to be on therapy and i as i, I tend to use the three-legged stool example, you know, there's the three things we've already talked about is how are you doing clinically, what are your lab values, and imaging. And, and we always outline to some degree like you've done here, like to have a lot of flexibility in it to your point because, you know, their, person, their life gets in the way. A little pearl and one of the really cool things about IO therapy, unlike chemotherapy, unlike oral targeted therapies is you do have a potential, and we still are continuing to look at this, is on trials, yes, you're absolutely right, Tom, as you point out, we try to get patients on an IO therapy. It's typically, you know, uh, hoped for one to two years. But what we do know is that the benefit of, chron the chronic benefit of getting the, uh, uh, an IO therapy doesn't stop when you stop the treatment. That's one of the real beautiful things, is sort of the tail of the curve. Uh, and I explain that to patients who are on IO, and they, they actually really like that, as opposed to once you're not getting your chemo and or your AR or, uh, or your oral or your TKI, et cetera, uh, therapy is theoretically stopping. <clears throat> so um, you know, just a couple of kind of technical slides, but just to kind of indicate that you know, this is a little bit different than what we're used to in terms of assessing response and um, and understanding what, how things are going. But and this is kind of pulled from a lot of the the um, medical oncology literature and white papers. 
But, you know, as Neil said, immunotherapy does not exhibit the same patterns of response in comparison to traditional chemotherapy. And there's time-specific differences um, in terms of how long patients take to mount an anti-tumor response. And, and not all patients respond the same. And that really does have implications. I mean, if you put someone on Pembro for BCG unresponsive CIS and you see a little bit of disease at your first follow-up, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to bag the whole program. I mean, and, and that's kind of where this, the clinical judgment piece comes in. Um, there is, you know, immunotherapy has its own rhesus criteria, which we know from, you know, our trials work. Um, and, and this modified criteria takes this into account um, because we actually consider stable disease, disease that actually has shown some increase in tumor burden, which is a little bit odd. But if you have up to a 20% increase in tumor burden, it's considered stable disease, and really the recommendation is to keep going. Now, a lot of this is derived from the metastatic literature um, or in a metastatic setting, but I think it holds probably the same weight. Um, and then, you know, th there's this concept of confirmed versus unconfirmed um, progression. And so these are two terms that medical oncologists know really well, um, but it's an important concept for urologists to understand that you can have a slight increase in, the, in, in, in disease burden, um, both cystoscopically, I would say, and radiographically, followed by some tumor regression. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the patients are failing therapy. So there is a percentage of patients that will progress maybe potentially initially because there is maybe a tumor inflammatory process, some sort of systemic response, and then their tumor will get better. So that's why kind of the first scan or the first cysto, if it looks, you know, a little bit worse, usually is not an indication to pull the plug. Um, and then kind of on the other extreme, there is a, an unfortunate set of patients who are going to really hyper-progress while they're on therapy. Um, and those patients, you know, you confirm that with, you know, serial imaging, but those patients unfortunately don't have a ton of options. Now, again, th this doesn't, you know, it's not like we see this a ton in our non-metastatic spaces, but I think that this, this biology does kind of apply to, um, to our understanding of how we're, we're doing this. So last couple of slides here are the adverse events. <clears throat> A lot of people, um, again, are, are interested in kind of how this plays out in the real world, and I think all of us would agree that with some, with some structure and with some experience, this is something that can be done and managed by urologists. Um, as a comparator, you know, if you look at high-grade clavian uh, adverse events, oral oncolytics and prostate cancer roughly are about 5% of patients that really either have to discontinue or they need um, to stop. In IO, it's probably in the 10 to 20% range. I think 20% is a little bit high uh, for the localized disease patient, but it's probably in the 10 to 20% range. And then cytotoxic chemotherapy is 40%. And so that's always something I tell patients is that, yes, there are some side effects, but certainly they tend to be more manageable and, and less, you know, uh, uh, impactful in terms of stopping therapy, having to come off, than chemotherapy. Unpredictable onset and, and duration of the side effects are a little bit, are the thing that a lot of people are concerned about. You can have patients who have been stable on treatment for a year and then all of a sudden um, develop something fairly uh, uh, significant. So, you know, that, that's where the structured monitoring piece has to come in. And then I think the champion physician part of this is important because the physician and the, the provider, the mid-level provider, need to work as a team to triage these complaints and to be able to handle them. And that's kind of <clears throat> what we do. Um, you saw my nurse practitioner, she's terrific. She'll telehealth visit them, send me a copy of that note. Anything that's concerning, she'll say, well, this patient's having you know four stools a day, more than they were last week. And then we put our heads together and put together a plan. And just like everything else that we, have, that we do in medicine, once you do it enough, you figure out kind of, you know, where to go and, 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 and how, what, what requires treatment, what requires observation. And there's a lot of published guidelines out there right now uh, that can help um, uh, manage this. Um, and, and certainly, you know, the, the, the overarching theme, I think, is trying to prevent, uh, trying to early identify side effects and trying to prevent long-term morbidity. So, I, you know, my staff is kind of tired of hearing me say, you know, 
you know, don't sleep on a on a new patient phone call that's on IO. Um, meaning, you know, if they have a new cough, if they have uh, a new diarrhea, um, any new side effect that they have not had before while they're on therapy, we should assume is related, and we got to follow up on it. Um, so three broad categories of management, um, and, and really I think most of us uh, understand that most of these are mild. Um, but if they're not affecting activities of daily life, they're considered grade one. And the vast majority of the time, these resolve with supportive or symptomatic treatment. An example is a topical steroid for a rash um, or uh, something like uh, Lamotil for diarrhea. Um, most of the time, those things will resolve, especially if the patient doesn't seem like they're missing a day of work or having to force themselves to stay home because of something like this. Moderate toxicity is seen, and I think this is something that if you're going to give this, you have to feel, you, you have to understand you're going to see this, um, and you have to prepare for this. So these are patients who actually do have some disruption of their day-to-day -day life. So their cough is significant enough that, you know, they're, 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 they have to stay home from work, or, you know, they feel like maybe they're a little short of breath. They're having so much diarrhea that they can't leave the house. Um, so those patients are going to require oral steroid treatment with a taper. Um, and, and I think one thing that, that the three of us have talked about offline here is, is the importance of engaging your, your medical colleagues and, and not to feel um, like that is out of bounds because that's something that is very important here, especially with some of the endocrine side effects that you see. Um, you know, engaging an endocrinologist, en engaging an ophthalmologist, um, a dermatologist if it's something that you don't really understand. Um, and that's, frankly, that's what medical oncologists have been doing for a long time, um, is, is, is having some uh, outlet uh, for someone else to, to help evaluate the patient, especially when you're first starting. And, and, and you may not realize if a patient will need something um, more systemic. So um, the ability to, to utilize your medical specialists, I think, is very important. And I think is something that a lot of us who do this well will we'll have kind of in our back pocket. Um, and then severe toxicity, and again, this is something that, that needs to be expressed to your staff and, and the doctors need to know. This is rare. Um, it, it really is something that, that we don't see very often, um, but it, it can happen, and there are plenty of reports in the literature about it. Um, and this is the patient who just is, you know, feeling terrible, uh, uh, you know, borderline unresponsive. Um, it just says, I, I'm having so much pain, I don't know what to do. Those patients should, should be brought into the hospital for multidisciplinary care, which usually, you know, consists of intravenous steroids, maybe something more significant, multidisciplinary consults, that kind of thing. Um, so sorry, this is a really busy slide, but I liked the messaging. This is from a white paper from uh, one of the ASCO um, guidelines. Uh, um, and and um, I won't go through everything, but, but, but there's a couple tenets that here that I really like. Education to the patient and the family about what can go wrong is, is really important. And so that's one thing our mid-levels do great. And, and really, if I'm in the room for five minutes, I spend four of the five minutes talking to them about the fact that, listen, don't assume that any of this stuff is, is normal. If you have something new, you have to call us. Um, come in, uh, and, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't feel right. You know, you can manage this in such a way, and a common question that we get is what happens at 2 in the morning if someone comes into the emergency room? It, it really, if you've structured the program and you have feedback from the patient and you're contacting patients, um, through their treatment course, that really doesn't happen. I think that will, that's going to happen more in a setting where these patients don't have kind of the understanding that something may go wrong. They're not really monitored very closely. They have small complaints that then turn into big complaints. So um, patient education is really great, and it's really a, a tenant even in the medical oncologist's kind of um, view here. Um, again, really new symptoms you know, things that are, are brand new. So a patient who has not had abdominal pain that all of a sudden has abdominal pain after two or three courses of treatment, that's something that should be should be considered uh, significant and brought in or monitored. Um, and, and, and again, kind of what we talked about before, hold the ICPs for low-grade toxicities. Um, you don't need necessarily need steroids. You just need to give them a holiday from the drug. Uh, and then uh, you can potentially get them back on the drug when their abnormality has, has improved. 
Um, and then if someone has a grade four, if someone has a high grade toxicity and they've needed long courses of steroids or long treatment course, uh, uh, you know, they've had a long uh, issue, don't put them back on checkpoint inhibitors. That's, that's the fundamental uh, bottom line. And, and, and that's kind of a, it, what's interesting is I think as you do more of this, there's a little bit of a gray area in that too, is, is that, you know, there are some patients and you talk to the medical oncologist and they'll agree, there are some patients that, you know, and their mantra is treat to toxicity, right? They're used to treating these patients until they get sick. That's kind of how they justify, um, the, you know, that's kind of how they view efficacy as well. If it's, it's clearly causing something to, to go on, so we're going to keep it going. Obviously, I, I think that in, in non-metastatic disease, we're a little bit more timid about that, but it's still, um, I think, uh, is it, something that's going to come out more is that you can probably get a lot of these patients back on treatment uh, after their primary issue is resolved, but certainly you want to be conscientious of the guidelines at this point. So we're just going to go through three quick cases. Um, these are cases from my clinic. I'd be interested to, to hear what Gordon and Neil have to say, and I think this is fairly reflective of what we see um, in a high-volume, uh, busy IO program. So <clears throat> this is a 66-year-old female who was on a clinical trial for muscle-invasive bladder cancer, and the trial was neoadjuvant immunotherapy prior to cystectomy. So she was cis ineligible, so she was starting creatinine with 1.7, and she had hydronephrosis on the left side. After her second infusion, she began to have significant lower extremity edema and fatigue. Um, we brought her in and we got labs. Her creatinine was up to 2.4. She was instructed to hydrate, and we kind of held the infusions. Her repeat check one week later was now it was higher at 3.2 after she'd been hydrating. Um, so she, she did have, obviously, hydronephrosis, so we said, well, let's just rule that out. So we looked in. Um, we did a retrograde. She had a stent placed on that left side. During the course of the retrograde, we noted, well, this probably is not significant enough to have her creatinine rise like this. Um, so as a precaution, we started oral prednisone, and a nephrology consult was made. And um, after one week uh, of the steroids, her creatinine had come down a little bit. Um, she was feeling a little bit better. We held the next infusion. Um, and so this was most likely uh, immune-mediated nephritis um, that got better uh, after an oral steroid taper. Based on the, the verbiage of the trial, the patient was uh, had to come off of the trial, and then she underwent radical cystectomy. So <clears throat> um, any thoughts, guys, on, on a case like this? I'm sure you guys have seen some nephritis. And nephritis is tough as a urologist because that's kind of where we live, right? We, we deal with elevated creatinines all the time. Uh, in, in patients who have hydro, and so that's why I thought, you know, this case is, is an interesting case to present because this isn't urologic renal demise, this is immune-mediated renal demise. Yeah, um, you know, you're, you're right. I mean, one of the things I'll say to patients to kind of keep it in a patient language friendly, you know, the, the lymphatic system, people are, they understand veins and arteries and arterioles, but explain that the lymphatics go everywhere from, you know, head to toe, skin and all organ systems. And so you can get an itis, an inflammation, you know, itis is, you know, is Greek for inflammation. And so you can get an itis virtually everywhere and anywhere. So to your point, always let us know if something's new and different. Uh, nephritis is pretty uncommon. Um, I completely agree with your management here. Um, and that's kind of how, you know, yeah, we, we want the patients to call right away. When in doubt, stop. When in doubt, you know, start uh, oral steroids. Uh, and then monitor the patients. And as you did here, it looks like the patient did fine. But given a clinical trial, they had to come off trial. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the next one's a patient who has M1 CRPC and actually found to have high tumor mutational burden. Um, he had started pembrolizumab and had done well with seven infusions, so kind of a long duration here. Um, significant rash uh, prior to his eighth infusion. So again, this kind of shows that this time course is fairly unpredictable. Um, so seven infusions, which is the better portion of a year without having a whole lot of issues. And then he had a significant rash. So the infusion was held. Um, the patient was prescribed topical steroids. Um, we did a telehealth visit to kind of look at everything um, after a few days, and the rash was actually getting worse uh, on topical steroids. So we started oral prednisone. Um, 
uh, you know, it's a weight-based formulation. Uh, and then in one week, uh, we brought the patient in, um, and, and the rash was improving. Um, steroids were continued, uh, and then the dose was tapered um, at week three. And, and, and actually, you know, this patient had a great response on pembrolizumab, and, and uh, as we all know, there's at, 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 you know, after a certain point in M1 CRPC, you don't have a lot of great options, so I didn't want to completely deprive him of that. We held it for a couple months, and we got him back on it. Um, and he actually was able to, to get back on it for six or seven more months um, until he progressed uh, further. Um, so last case, and I think we're almost just out of time, but uh, this is probably one that, that um, you know, uh, is something you don't necessarily want to have happen, but th this is something you have to be prepared to have happen. 79-year-old um, male with BCG unresponsive CIS, um, and, and notably this patient probably was one of those people that you look at and you're like, well, you know, systemic therapy for you may, you know, may have some issues. He, he, he wasn't a spring chicken, um, and he had, but he had severe bladder symptoms, severe BCG fatigue, um, and, and really was interested in, in an uh, intravenous uh, in, uh, therapy when I talked to him about all his options. So he did fine on pembrolizumab for the first two infusions, and then uh, prior to the third infusion, he started having abdominal pain. Um, he had elevations of AST, ALT, and his T billy was up to two and a half. So, um, you know, transaminitis, autoimmune transaminitis, we withheld his uh, infusion and we began uh, oral steroids. So after two weeks, his, his AST and ALT now had been rising quite rapidly. He's now at 1,000. His T-billy was four. He was jaundiced. Um, he looked like he was getting worse. So I, I called my uh, hepatology GI colleagues, um, and, I, and I talked to him, and I said, well, should we admit this patient, or do you want to see him? And they said, well, you know, wh why don't we see him as an outpatient the next day and, and see what's, you know, what we can do? So they got a, a right upper quadrant ultrasound that was okay, for no obstruction. They continued steroids, um, and, 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 and I, again, I think this is where it helps to have kind of seasoned colleagues around you. He, he called me back and he said, yeah, this sucks, but this is, this is going to get better, but it's just going to take a long time. Um, he said, I, I don't think he's going to need IV. He, he's probably plateauing where his LFTs are. I'll see him once a week to check his LFTs, but he's just going to stay on steroids. And... Uh, and, and so um, it, was, it, it was quite a long course of steroids. And on elderly patients, when you're on steroids for this long, you've got to think about other things going wrong, right? GI prophylaxis for ulcers, uh, pneumonia prophylaxis, um, and, and, and bone, bone disease. So we, we kind of had a, a multidisciplinary kind of meeting about, you know, what, what we needed. And, um, you know, this patient was on steroids for a long time. Uh, we ultimately weaned him off. Um, He's made a full recovery. He's doing fine, and, and thankfully, actually, his bladder looks good. But this was technically a grade four autoimmune hepatitis based on the levels that his transaminase has reached. So we had to permanently discontinue. So um, I think this is a you know case that kind of illustrates some of those things. Anyone, you guys have a comment on kind of a more severe case like this? Well, I would just I would just say that you, you, you're going to run across these. They're 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 not their rule, but you will see them. And, um, you know, I remember I was at a program with, you know, a very good friend and colleague, a medical oncologist at Johns Hopkins, who said, you know what, I, I really enjoy learning more and more about I.O. because it's forcing me to kind of channel my, um, my inner internal medicine uh, chops. And that's true for us, too. And I, and I think this is a very illustrative case. You, got, you want to rule out anatomical obstruction. You know, I'm sure they may have got a hepatitis panel. And, and, and that's okay. I mean, there are, you know, you, these are, you know, these are patients who are going to have complications in this. So this is not for the dabblers. This isn't a dalliant. You got to be into this. And medonks, uro-oncologists, we can work really great with our subspecialty internal medicine colleagues. It's a great case. Yeah, I think it highlights the, you know, the need for, for multidisciplinary collaboration to, to, you know, manage patients appropriately throughout their course. Um, Unfortunately, uh, both to, to Neil and Tom's point, we don't see this frequently, but when we do, we have to be prepared to deal with it. And I think in robust clinics, which you have the infrastructure, um, you know, these patients do well if you, if you, you know, reach across the aisle, so to speak, and engage the help you have in the community, which oftentimes everybody's ready to help, you know, for patient benefit. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's really all um, we have. So just kind of to, to sum up those three big points that we had, 
um, at the beginning, you know, the utilization of checkpoint inhibitors is growing in urology. Um, and I think urologists, either you know, if they're treating themselves or they're not, they need to be fully aware of the roles and the indications. The checkpoint inhibitors can be implemented into a busy urologic practice, I think, utilizing existing personnel um, and, and really have similar needs and, 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 uh, and, and, and resources that your other cancer programs have. It's not something that you need to build from the ground up. And then I think the adverse events uh, are, are manageable, but really should be, uh, sh should be thought of uh, as part of a bigger structured program where you're monitoring efficacy, you're monitoring safety, um, and, and, and you're utilizing kind of, you know, multiple people to help. So that's really it. Sorry we went over a minute or two and um, probably too many slides on, on our part. But um, any, any questions, any, um, you know, or any comments from anybody? Certainly we'll, three of us will be around for a few minutes too if you want to come up and chat about something offline. But um, good. Well, thanks for coming. I think it's cool that the AUA kind of... Um, uh, you know, is asked us to kind of do this and is moving in, in, in this direction because I think this is only going to get more and more interesting for all of us in, in what we do in neurologic oncology. So, okay. Thank you, guys.